I think we're here. If you could close the doors, gentlemen, that would be appreciated. And uh, Jeff Tunis, of course, is a graduate of Indiana University, 28 years of service to the State Department, great service to Indiana University. And his service has been in the field as a foreign service officer. He didn't sit in Washington, D.C. Uh, and watch things on the mall or in the Potomac. He was where the rubber meets the road. So, Jeff? Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Again, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here this morning. And uh, please, if you do have any questions, don't hold them back to the end. Uh, raise your hand, and that'll, we'll, we'll keep things going. Because I do want to, I do want to ask, uh, answer your questions. And also, I want to make this kind of relevant to you, with, with I think, a couple of exceptions here, here. Most of you are going to be in the job market pretty soon. So I hope that, that as I take this from Bill's macro level discussion, this larger philosophical worldwide discussion, I want to kind of bring it down to some nuts and bolts. You know, who are the actors in U.S. foreign policy? And then what, based on my recent experience in Indonesia, what are some of the issues uh, uh, that came out to play? So one of the things that, that I think has been talked about a lot uh, in the literature uh, uh, since 9-11, uh, certainly uh, Secretary Gates actually was a big proponent of this debate, which, which was soft versus hard power. Soft power is typically thought of as the State Department. Things that you do short of knocking down a door and going in and, and grabbing bad guys, killing bad guys, which is hard power. Typically, if you, look at, if you look at the State Department, if you look at U.S. foreign policy, I think a big dividing line is World War II, as, as Bill's been talking about, and backing it up a little bit to World War I and the Spanish-American War. Certainly, if you look at uh, how U.S. foreign policy was conducted uh, before, say, 1939, it was largely the State Department, and, lar and that was a very small organization. Uh, I think the State Department, uh, pre-World War II, was something like four or 500 foreign service officers. Now we're about 7,000 foreign service officers. To put that in perspective, if you, I spent 25 years in the, in the Navy Reserve. To put that in respective, perspective, if you look at the size of an aircraft carrier battle group, there are about 2,500 uh, guys on the ship, about 2,500 uh, in the air wing on the carrier alone, plus you add some destroyers and support ships. So the total of foreign service officers, 7,800, is less than one uh, Navy aircraft carrier battle group. And we have 13 of them or 11? Thir we're going, well, we, have, we have 11 now. We have 11 now, yeah. So I've, I've been retired from the Navy Reserve for a few years, too. Um, and the foreign service is spread out in 180 countries around the world in 280 establishments. Con embassies, consulate generals, uh, consulates. The operation in, in, in Benghazi I don't think counts because it really was not a consulate even though it was, it was discussed as that. So the structure of the Foreign, the structure of the foreign Service uh, has, has changed a lot. Um, and the players in U.S. Foreign, foreign policy since World War II have expanded quite a bit. And if you look at it in terms of a, a micro level, every embassy has what's called a country team. And that's the senior management group at the embassy. The chair of the country team is the ambassador. Uh, now, ambassadors are the president's personal representatives to that country. He's appointed by the president to represent U.S. interests in that particular country. And he has control, speaking for the name of the president, over all executive branch personnel in that country, with one big exception, and those are combat, combatant forces assigned uh, to a, a DOD unified commander. Um, so for example, in Korea, where I was almost five years, uh, U.S. Forces Korea has a separate command structure that goes to DOD and then to the president. But everybody else in that country, uh, every other U.S. government presence in that country falls under the authority of the ambassador. And who are ambassadors? Well, you know, you, you, uh, they're all State Department employees, whether or not they were hired from the outside or whether they came up through the ranks, uh, you know, kind of like I did, although I didn't get that far. Um, and, I, and to be perfectly honest, I've served, I've served under both. I've served under outside guys and internal guys. And, and good guys come in both stripes and jerks come in both stripes. Uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, an ambassador really is a manager. He's not an analyst. Uh, the policy is made in Washington. You're not, we're, when, we were in, when I was in Korea, we weren't sitting around thinking about how, what we're going to do with North Korea and how we're going to do it and how we're going to deal with the North Koreans. I mean, that came up, but it came up in the context of what the South Koreans are doing. But what 
but U.S. policy regarding North Korea is made in Washington, not there. One of the ambassador's big powers is this, NSDD 38, National Security Decision Directive 38. That gives the ambassador the ultimate authority of who goes in and out of that country, with, again, with the exception of deployed forces. So the ambassador does not control ship movements and personnel movements going to Yokosuka to Japan to go on and off uh, uh, U.S. Navy ships there or to the 2nd Infantry Division in, in, uh, in Korea or to the ISAF forces in Afghanistan. But everybody else, um, the military guys who fall under his authority, the people who are doing training, uh, the, uh, uh, the, guys in the, the 500 guys in the southern Philippines who are fighting um, uh, the insurgents there, they have to get the ambassador's permission or the embassy's permission to move in and out. And that's really important because that, that relates to this particular acronym, which I was trying to think of what it means because I used to deal with it quite a bit. But it is the, uh, it's, an in, it's the Interagency Administrative Support System, and I forget what C stands for. But this is what pays for it all. There's a cost to everything. Any of you who've, who've worked anywhere, whether in the government or the private sector, know there's a, always a cost. None of this comes free. You know, when you s assign people overseas, you have to house them, feed them, transport them, uh, give them medical support, uh, all of those things. And so these two are linked because when you bring somebody into the country, somebody has to pay for it. And that gets us down to resources here. So I've talked about people, you know, how many people there are in the Foreign Service. There are about 7,800 officers. I was one of them. Um, there are uh, probably another five or 6,000 civil service people, not Foreign Service people, uh, who are mainly in Washington. Uh, the bulk of our employees are what we call our uh, Foreign Service Nationals, or locally engaged staff. And we have probably about 40,000 of them. And so if you, have any, have, has anyone here ever been to an embassy or consulate for any reason? Walked in the door, asked for something? Yeah, where were you and what did you? I was interned at the um, Mexican consulate in Indianapolis. In? The Mexican consulate here in Indianapolis. Oh, okay, okay. Um, how about a U.S. embassy or consulate overseas? Has anybody been in one? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think that was where we Americans voted when I lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil. When, when were you there? Um, 76, 77, 78. Okay. Um, actually, you didn't vote there. No, because no, voting is, a, is under our Constitution is a state responsibility. There's no, there are no federal laws that, that, uh, that would affect your voting overseas. But we would have provided, as, as part of a service to American citizens overseas, among other things, voting information, the registration forms. You would have filled out a state ballot and probably given it to us in those days, and we'd send it back to the, to the US, to that state, uh, through the diplomatic pouch. Um, but we were, we were facilitators. But when you went there, who did you deal with? Do you remember? You probably dealt at first with, with, well, with the local with the staff. Brazilians. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Americans, you know, if you go into an embassy overseas, you think, oh, I'm here, I want to speak to an American. This is American soil, this is, this is the USA. No, it's not. It, it is a, it is a federal courthouse overseas. It's a building. We don't, we don't live at embassies. We don't eat there. It's not like the Bourne identity. We have a bunch of people walking down hallways in suits and ties and, you know, Marine guards in, in their camis, you know, all out front keeping terrorists out. It's, not, it's a federal courthouse with a whole bunch of different agencies there. But the first people you see are, are probably the local staff. And that often surprises folks because they'll come into an embassy and, they, and they'll deal with the local staff who are recruited locally, stay there for their careers. We, we transfer around every two or three or four years, know the ropes, know the law, know how things work. And my local staff will explain something to an American in great detail and usually quite good English. And the, and the American will turn around and say, well, I want, to, I want to talk to an American. I want to talk to your boss. That's probably the worst thing you can do. Because <laughs> you might get an American who looks like the local staff. Most foreign service officers, many foreign service officers, don't look like me anymore. They may have before World War II, but the Foreign Service is an incredibly diverse organization now. In fact, in my uh, entry-level class in 1983, we took a poll of the, I think there are about 35 new officers in the class, as to which state most, uh, most of the new officers were from. You know, which, which state had the most connection to that class? Can anyone guess? Take a wild guess. Kansas. Kansas, good guess, <laughs> not right? California. No, that's, that's a better guess. New York, Massachusetts, Virginia. No. The one state that people had most connections to, they'd lived there, they'd been born there, they went work there, went to school there, was Indiana. 
So the Foreign Service is not what you think it is. And the Foreign Service is not full of guys who go to Yale or Harvard <coughs> or Georgetown and study foreign policy. In fact, that's the worst thing you can do if you want to be a Foreign Service officer or if you want to work overseas for the US government. But getting back to these issues here, so in, in terms of money, if you looked at a pie chart of the US government budget, the Defense Department would be about half of the pie. About, I think, the, in the fiscal year 2014 budget is something like $657 billion. State Department budget, which includes foreign aid, includes uh, some military assistance, <coughs> is about, eight, <coughs> about $80 billion. <coughs> but if you break it down even more, the budget for the, for the uh, National Guard in the US to pay for the, to pay for the to pay for the National Guard in the US is the same as the budget to pay for the entire State Department operations overseas. So it is a very lean organization. And why is that? Well, we don't, we don't do agricultural subsidies. We don't have bases that employ people. We don't build ships. We don't have a great constituency. You know, people think that, oh, the State Department, you're just, you're just a bunch of, uh, you know, a pinstripe to cookie pushers. You guys just go to cocktail parties and all of that. And maybe some of the things I'll tell you about uh, will uh, we'll change your mind about that. But the other thing that's happened, I think, since World War II, and, the, and the related to this, is the growth of the, of the other agencies uh, at a US embassy. Probably before World War II, if you walked into an embassy, uh, people like me, some of them would have taken an examination. Some of them, uh, maybe 50 years before that, it was a political patronage job uh, to be a consul. Um, but that's all changed, and, and certainly in the Foreign Service Act of 1980 was the most recent change to that, which codified who foreign service officers are, what we have to do. We cannot spend more than six years in the United States. Um, I broke that rule, um, but because uh, uh, I, I never served in the U.S., although I came back for training. But it created foreign services for some other agencies, including uh, agriculture and commerce. They have their own foreign services now. But there are a whole host of other agencies, what we call non-foreign affairs agencies, that have a huge presence overseas. In an embassy and a country team, you'll have the ambassador. You'll have the deputy chief of mission, who is his executive officer. Like on a ship, the commanding officer, the ship's eyes are out. What's going on above, on the surface, and below the ship? The XO of a ship is looking inward. How is the ship running? Do I have enough people? Do I have enough supplies? Is the equipment all running? So that's the deputy chief of mission. He's, he's, he's running the, uh, the operation. But you'll have state people from the different functions. The Foreign Service <coughs> Act of 80 specified the five functions in the State Department. There's political, uh, economic, management, uh, which is a hugely important function, consular, which is what I did, and public diplomacy, which is public information, cultural exchanges, things like that. But also, there'll be people from DOD. Pretty much every embassy now has at least a defense attache, uh, if not uh, in, a security advisory group, a mill group, um, a security assistance team. Um, let's see, what else are they called? The folks who basically arrange for training of foreign military forces in the United States, uh, foreign military sales of, of U.S. equipment to those armed forces. The CIA will be there. Uh, and the, the, uh, the Jack O'Connell article, I hope all of you read it or you will read it. It's really interesting. And it, uh, we were talking about it at dinner last night. And I, I worry that the things that he did that were so successful, I'm not sure we can do that anymore. And we can talk about that a little bit. So you've got state, DOD, CIA. What are some of the other agencies you might think be represented overseas in a big way? FBI. Pardon me? FBI. Yeah, FBI. They're called legal attaches. Um, there are not many of them, maybe one or two, maybe more. But it's a small, small presence, but very important. I'm sorry? Department of Energy. Yeah, yeah, not, not many, but small. There's a huge, huge new agency now. Homeland Security has a lot of people overseas. Uh, TSA has people overseas. ICE has people overseas. Um, border. Homeland Security told us that um, we deploy it to zone three. And it's better, better to win that thing uh, in Georgia than in Atlanta. So ICE, and as, as Jeff has said, ICE and CBP and TSA, along with Secret Service, along with Coast Guard Big Boat, mm -hmm. and a little bit of FEMA, mm -hmm. are all overseas. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to talk about that when we get over here to some of the issues in Indonesia. Um, agriculture, there's a foreign agricultural service responsible for promoting U.S. agricultural exports. 
for a state like Indiana, that's huge. Department of Commerce has a foreign commercial service. Um, they hire, unlike the foreign service, unlike the state's foreign service, uh, the ag and commerce guys, a lot of them come in at mid-level after they've had private sector experience in those fields. Um, and then you get to a big embassy like Tokyo. I spent two, two tours in Tokyo. They have energy guys there. Um, the FAA has guys there. NASA has two guys in, in Tokyo. If you think of all of the issues in which the U.S. government functions, many of them, if not most of them, have an international component. And those agencies have typically been better at getting resources and money than the State Department, because NASA has a constituency. Energy has constituencies. You know, what we do in state is largely out of sight of the American public. So, so as the interconnectedness of the world has increased, and those agencies have gotten more money post-World War II, there's a huge presence overseas. So that's one of my takeaways to folks here. You know, if you are interested in an international career, there are lots of different opportunities, lots of different ways into it. And we can talk about some of those tactics a, li a little bit later, if you like, or, or certainly afterwards. So I want to move to some kind of micro issues in Indonesia here. <clears throat> some of the things that um, I dealt with, I was the consul general there uh, for about two and a half years. And uh, uh, these, some of these I, I worked on directly. Others were going on at the time. First one, I was responsible, as a consular officer, you have two functions, uh, a visa function, which is for folks coming to the United States, and what we call a citizen services function, and that's for Americans who are overseas, usually in distress. Sometimes they need to vote. Sometimes it's an American retiree who's got questions about Social Security. Uh, and sometimes, usually, more usually, though, it's an American who's in trouble, uh, somebody who gets arrested, somebody who dies, and then you uh, have to, to deal with the aftermath. Uh, this function also, um, if there's a crisis and we have to evacuate a country, uh, the State Department, uh, by presidential directive, is the lead agency for, evacu for, for, um, uh, for dealing with Americans in crisis overseas. If it gets beyond two or three hundred Amer private Americans who are affected, we very quickly turn to DOD because DOD has the resources that we don't. We don't have aircraft, we don't have portable hospitals, we don't have uh, reception stations. Remember, we have 7,800 officers spread over uh, uh, 280 establishments around the world, so we're pretty small. <clears throat> so what are a couple of the issues for Indonesia on visas? Well, let's take this one first. When I got there in 2009, there was a travel warning, in effect, from Indonesia. It resulted from the Bali bombings that mostly affected Australians. Uh, about 200, 250 Australians were killed in two bombings, uh, suicide bombings in, uh, in Bali, in nightclubs. And, you know, like a lot of dangerous places, the U.S. government puts out a warning to tell Americans, hey, if you go somewhere, be aware that something bad can happen. Um, it's not a prohibition. The U.S. Uh, can no longer prohibit tra travel through the State Department's mechanisms. We can, pro the U.S. government can prohibit travel through financial restrictions. So if you want to travel to Cuba, it's not a State Department ban. It's a violation of the Trading with the Enemy Act and you can't pay for your trip. If the Cuban government invites you, then, you're, then, then you can go. So why would a travel warning be tough? Why would that be an issue that, that we would want to handle? Well, first of all, it, it casts doubt on that host country's government, uh, government's ability to, to maintain its national sovereignty, to control its borders, to provide security for people inside the country. You know, you, uh, with the recent unfortunate shooting of the, uh, of the Australian student in Oklahoma, there were folks in, in Australia where he was from who were saying that Australians shouldn't travel to the United States. Well, how would you feel about that? You know, it's, that was a tragic shooting, but that was one incident in Oklahoma. You're living in Indiana. How, you know, what? Is it unsafe here? If you're the, um, if you're the mayor of a big city, you, no one wants to be told, if you're the mayor of Las Vegas, no, you don't want to be told it's unsafe to go to Las Vegas. So this was the first issue that, that we had to deal with. It also meant that American businessmen would be reluctant to go there. Uh, some of it's legal. Um, if, they, if, if a guy from GE gets hurt in Indonesia, you know, his, the GE corporate lawyers are worried about being sued because the company sent him somewhere that was dangerous. And if, and if he's not going there, uh, GE probably can't sell $700 million worth of uh, uh, rail, uh, uh, railroad uh, uh, rolling stock it's made in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I guess the folks in Erie, Pennsylvania would like to have those jobs. 
Actually, <clears throat> the travel warning I thought when I got there wasn't all that bad, but it, I mean, it was pretty benign like most of them are, but it, but it was a huge public relations uh, uh, impediment to what was going on. And so, um, you know, the, we did some research and found out that, you know, the incidence of crime in Indonesia and all that was lower than most cities in the U.S., and so it was lifted. Um, visas was, was a larger issue. When I, when I got there um, in uh, 2009, the Indonesian, for example, foreign student population in the U.S. had gone down from about 15,000 students a year coming to the United States in 1999 to about 2,500 uh, in 2009. Why is that important? Well, foreign students, contrary to what most people think, pay full, full freight. They pay out-of-state tuition. Each foreign student in the U.S., we figured, uh, was, was a net gain of $50,000 to the United States per year. And if you add trips by parents, and you add four, maybe five years of education in the United States, each foreign student's a quarter million dollars a year. Uh, they're not taking up spaces. They're, they're, they're paying for a lot of stuff. And so what we did was we kind of we embarked on a, on a public relations effort. We, tried, we, we told people that the US is open for business. We're open for students. We welcome you. Um, I sent my young vice consuls uh, to uh, to high schools that, would, that are likely going to send students to the United States to talk to them. Um, we redirected some of our resources. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're limited, as I told you earlier, in terms of people and money, what we can do. So we did about 60,000 visas a year there. That was our physical capacity. We couldn't get any more people through the door. No matter what kind of visa it was, student, tourist, business, um, crew visa on a merchant ship, 60,000 a year. Um, one of the visa categories we had uh, were temporary workers in the United States, and there was a lot of fraud involved in that. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, indentured servitude, but it came close. So what we did was we shut that program down. We were the only country in the world to shut that particular visa program down. And we redirected our resources to increasing student visas. So when I left, we had a 20% increase, which I thought was pretty good, the student visas coming to the U.S. It's also important, too, because these kids, when they go back home, if they go to work for a construction company and they need to buy tractors 20 years later, what do you think they're going to buy? Are they going to buy Komatsu tractors or are they going to buy Caterpillar tractors? So there's a knock-on effect that's really important. Military aid. <clears throat> this, was, this was a huge issue um, that, that really consumed a lot of folks. Kopasis is the Indonesian Special Forces Command. Uh, Kopasis is, the Indonesian Armed Forces are not really well trained. Uh, Kopasis, and the analysts, analysts say Kopasis is the equivalent to maybe um, a well-trained U.S. infantry unit. The rest of the armed forces are an armed rabble, and, and their job um, um, is, uh, is, is um, whatever it is, it's not defending the country. But Kopasis, if you're, if you're an Indonesian leader, are the, are the go-to forces for the country. Um, Indonesia, as you might remember from a long time ago in the 70s, took over the former Portuguese colony of East Timor. Um, uh, when, when Portugal gave up Macau to China, it also gave up East Timor to China. Uh, the East Timor people are Catholic. Indonesia is a Muslim-majority country. And living under the Portuguese was probably better than living under the Indonesians. The Indonesian government, though, used Kapasas to invade Timor, take it over. Uh, in the process, uh, conducted a very brutal crackdown uh, killed a bunch of Australian journalists, murdered them, um, uh, killed, uh, I think, the bishop, uh, the Catholic bishop, bishop of East Timor. And um, Kopasis was also used in, uh, to put down the uh, anti-Chinese riots and the anti-government riots uh, when, Su uh, when Suharto fell in the late, uh, late 80s. The, uh, the current chief of staff to the Indonesian president is a guy I had to deal with because he wanted a visa to come to the United States. Uh, with the president for a G20 meeting in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, he had taken about 40 students out in a boat about 30 miles offshore and pushed them over the side. And uh, he is the, he, if you see picture, there was a great picture I saved it of the economist, from the economist of the president of Indonesia with this guy standing right behind him. He carries the guy's bags. He is, he is, he's a deputy secretary of defense now. Um, the leading presidential candidate in Indonesia was a commander of Kapasis during that time. He's, he can't get into the U.S. or Australia. So it would be interesting if he's elected, he can't come here. Um, but having said that, um, that is in the past. 
And the, the people who did that, you know, the privates, the sergeants, the lieutenants, the captains, in the 70s, they're gone. They're out of the service. They're gone. And, you know, post 9-11, we are faced with a, the, the largest Muslim-majority country in the world that has been a, um, the, the, the scene of, of horrific terror attacks that is, has ethnic and military ties, or, or folks in Indonesia have ethnic and military ties to, a, to an active insurgency in the southern Philippines. So these are the guys you have to deal with if, you, if you're talking about national security. So the idea was how can, we, how can we train these guys? How can we give them US standard training so that they won't go out and, and kill people, throw students off a boat, shoot journalists, um, you know, shoot, uh, shoot priests, things like that. Uh, and that, that consumed a huge amount of our time, trying to figure out a way, how can we identify certain parts of this unit, certain people, isolate the bad guys, and try to offer the good guys training. It was a huge issue for the Indonesians, because again, this was their flagship arm. This, this was their, their flagship part of the armed forces. This was their, represented their country. Um, um, you know, Kopasis people, there, there are, I think about 800 Indonesian peacekeepers in the, in the Golan Heights, and Kapasas people are there. So if they send people overseas and we're trying to encourage them to do it, these are the people we need to go to. So eventually, we, we, we've come to some understanding. We've been able to isolate those, those units which we can give training to and identify the bad people. Now, um, a couple other issues here. I've, I've put this, this acronym here, ISITAP, here, here, in here, and since so many of you uh, folks are, are doing criminal justice degrees, you might be interested in this. And I, I cannot remember what ISITAP stands for, what the acronym stands for, um, but it, it, it is a, a U.S. Department of Justice uh, initiative, uh, anti-terror, anti-narcotics initiative. And it's here in these three different places because it's a, very, it's a very interesting organization. It has about a $250 million budget in Indonesia. So again, going back to resources, if you look at the whole for U.S. foreign assistance budget in Indonesia for health, for education, um, for uh, uh, what they call capacity building, that's 250 million. And the aid mission in Indonesia has about 60 people managing that. There are two direct hire guys managing this $250 million for CTAP. So it's great bang for your buck. And the, it's interesting, the guys who run it, both of them are retired policemen. One guy was a retired Phoenix uh, Police Department sergeant who, would then, who took a job as a contractor in Pakistan and then became a direct hire of the U.S. Justice Department. And the other guy, uh, his deputy, had been one of his instructors, I think, at the uh, Arizona Peace Officers Academy. Uh, so these guys are law enforcement professionals who made a mid-career change into this very important organization. Now, why have I listed it here next to these three things? Next, South China Sea, anti-terror, and up here, crisis, uh, Padang, which was an earthquake. Well, the South China Sea it involves a geopolitical interest of the United States. If you, if you look at a map, and I can, I'm not sure I can draw a map of Indonesia very well, but here's Borneo, here's the Malaysian Peninsula, here's Singapore down here. And here's all of Indonesia, and then there's Thailand and Vietnam up there, and then China's up here. So this is the South China Sea here. Um, in the 1500s, a, a eunuch Chinese admiral explored Indonesia, and, and they say he went all the way to East Africa. Well, because he traveled down here and apparently planted a flag here, this area is called the Tung. The Chinese now claim this area all the way down here. Remember, China's about 500 miles up here. So the Chinese are claiming all down here. And you might know that Indonesia is an oil producing country and one of the biggest natural gas finds they found is here. So the Chinese are conveniently claiming it like they conveniently claim islands off, Philipp off the Philippines which are rich fishing grounds and, and astride this very important sea lane uh, which goes from the Middle East through the Straits of Malacca past Singapore up to Japan. So the, the Chinese claim this as their territory. We have been trying to get the Indonesians to push back really hard. The Indonesian foreign policy is that we, have, we are friends with, anyone, with everyone and enemies to no one. Well, that's nonsense. You can't, <laughs> you can't do that. And that goes back to um, Sukarno's, um, Sukarno being a co-founder of the non-aligned movement in the 1950s with Tito. And so they have this idea that they don't want to, get, they don't want to hurt anybody. They want to be friends with everyone, but that's ridiculous. We have a problem with Kopasis. We can't give these guys military aid. 
So you have, you have armed Chinese vessels down here, not Chinese Navy, but armed fishery patrol vessels down here. And also, this is Borneo, coming down this side of Borneo and the other side with fishing fleets. The law is the Leahy Amendment that prevents us from helping Kapasis does not address Coast Guard and police. And so ISITAP, not through the, ministry of the Indonesian Ministry of Defense, but through the Ministry of Maritime Affairs, set up a maritime police agency. They bought patrol boats, coastal surveillance radar for them. It's about a $180 million program. And the idea is it's every country needs a Coast Guard. Every country needs to know who's coming in and out of its borders. Um, Coast Guards are used for a whole bunch of things. They're used for search and rescue. They're used for uh, maritime patrol, fisheries patrol, to ensure that this very rich country in, in fisheries resources isn't overfished. Well, for, this, for our pushback against the Chinese, it was through this organization and the, and the Ministry of Maritime Affairs uh, and its armed boats actually got into some shooting confrontations with the Chinese that were never reported. And that caused the Chinese to push back. So this was, in terms of an issue and in terms of an organizational player, this was really important uh, to our interests. Because our goal is to see that the South China Sea remains open. Not, it doesn't belong to us. It doesn't belong to the Chinese. It doesn't belong to the Singaporeans or the Malays who don't want it. And the Indonesians don't want it either. It, everyone agrees it should be open, except for the Chinese in this case. Anti-terror. Well, I mentioned the Bali bombings in 2004. Um, uh, there were, when I was there, there was, a, there was suicide bombings of the Marriott uh, uh, Hotel <coughs> and, uh, in the summer of 2009. Uh, ISITAP is, is the major source of funding, along with the Australians, for the uh, Indonesian anti-terror police and their uh, internal intelligence forces. And again, because of our involvement and the Australians' involvement, these guys are trained to do things in a good way, um, not, not in a bad way. Um, some of the other things, though, that, that these guys were involved in funding, it's a little less sexy than, than, uh, than police work and raids on, on uh, facilities, is the court system. The Indonesian court system has no central records. If you're, if you're arrested in the second largest city, Surabaya, there's no central way to find out about that arrest. If I pull you over in Jakarta, and, and try to call up a file. There is no, there is no file. It's um, happened many times. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it did. <laughs> um, if you go to trial in Indonesia, there, there are no bailiffs or sheriffs who maintain order in the court. And so typically, a guy who's arrested on an anti-terror charge or a graft charge or a robbery charge, he'll bring all of his buddies in there. They don't search them for weapons on the way in. These guys will be standing there with, with bulges under their coats. They'll be yelling. They'll be talking at the judge. So can you imagine what the conviction rate is like? They know where the judge lives. Um, there's no secure holding for them. Um, this was a huge problem when we found an Indonesian guy in Pakistan and who was traveling on a false Philippine passport. And he was invited to return to, to the Philippines, but the, the Philippines didn't want him, so he ended up, he was Indonesian, so he came back to Indonesia, but there was no way to try him, no way to hold him. There was no secure holding cell. So this is a, this is a huge initiative. We're also, they also send a lot of people to the U.S. Uh, for training, uh, um, uh, uh, prosecutors for training. The guy who runs it reports to, uh, to Jerry, who handles ISITAP, but he's a former uh, uh, U.S. attorney in Chicago. Really nice guy. <coughs> Crises, I should have made that a uh, plural. Well, you, you all remember the 2004 tsunami, probably, um, that affected not only Indonesia, but all of Southeast Asia. Uh, that allowed the United States, after 9-11, after, after the attacks on 2001, in a Muslim-majority country, to demonstrate how hard power can be used for a soft end. We sent the, uh, uh, um, the George Washington Carrier Battle Group from Yokosuka offshore of Indonesia. Uh, for those of you who know what, a, what, a, what an amphibious uh, uh, a uh, ship is like, or an aircraft carrier is like, not only do they have weapons, but they've got hospitals, they've got water purification equipment, they've got the, the, the uh, Marines, the Embark Marines have a civil engineering capability. They can do a lot of things, and they certainly did. And that certainly helped the, the image of the United States. There was an earthquake in, on Sumatra, a very large earthquake in, in 2009, and again, 
these ISITAP guys went up there. Well, one of the other things ISITAP is doing is working on an EMS system in, in Indonesia. If you, uh, if you have a heart attack, that, well, I used to tell visiting American businessmen that your biggest danger in coming to Indonesia is not being killed by a, by a suicide bomber. It's not a drive-by shooting. Your biggest danger is having a heart attack on a Friday afternoon when it's raining and you're stuck in traffic, because you will die. First of all, the traffic's horrible. The road system sucks. Uh, a, a country which is in the middle of the monsoon belt doesn't have storm drains, so the streets flood. Um, a, uh, there is no ambulance service. In a country of 240 million people, there are four internationally accredited hospitals. So e even if you get into an ambulance, there won't be any equipment in it. Nobody's trained. Even if you can get through traffic, unless you go to one of those four hospitals, uh, one, is in, one is in Sumatra, one is outside of Jakarta, and two are in Jakarta, you're going to die. Simple. That's the way it is. So again, these guys, because they're setting up a, an, an EMS system, an emergency system, they had gear, they had training, they bring over a lot of short-term contractors. A lot of them are retired fire department people from the United States. They have a lot of retired Coast Guard people there. We sent them up there to Padang uh, to, to help the Indonesians set up a notification system because there was none. And they were there uh, in Padang when, a, uh, when a, 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 an Air Force hospital flew in from Guam. It was all set up. Uh, so they provided a lot of the communications on the ground. A couple other issues, and then I'll stop, and hopefully you have some questions that we're involved in. Health. You know, one of the foreign policies changed a lot over the years. And you know, just looking at the State Department budget, we spent $5.8 billion on our operations. That's hiring people, training them, moving them, paying them, you know, things, things to keep our, our core running. We spent $8.8 .8 billion out of the State Department budget on health issues. The, uh, the uh, President Bush's uh, AIDS initiative in Africa, um, a lot of other things that we're doing. So it's, it's a huge issue. And it, again, it points to the fact that traditional ways of looking at a job in foreign affairs, a job related to international things, just doesn't come from studying political science in a language. It comes from other issues. This was kind of a failure in Indonesia. And this is where, this is where you know, having, having poor soft power there hurt us. We had, NAMRU was the Naval Administrative Medical Research Unit. We have three of them in the world. One, we had three. One was in Jakarta, one was in Bangkok, and one was in Cairo. And these were, these were Navy-run units, but they probably only had about five guys in uniform there running it, and probably 200 other local and US, US short-term, not many US direct hire scientists there doing research on diseases that we, our armed forces, would encounter that are not uh, found in the United States. So it was, it's really important to US national defense that we would be there. It was all open source. It was all unclassified. If we have a, an FSN, a locally engaged staff working in our spaces, that information, they, they don't get security clearances, so it's unclassified. We would share it. Unfortunately, when that, uh, when that uh, organization came up for renewal, the lease, I, the agreement had expired when I was there, the Ministry of Health was somebody who had been refused a visa before I got there. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the whole visa process. Um, because of a possible uh, uh, name hit, her name was similar to a terrorist name somewhere, and she wasn't one. But she was mad about that. She was also mad about the prices of, of US pharmaceuticals being sold there and how she wanted um, private companies, Abbott Labs and other companies, uh, Eli Lilly to share proprietary information. And she couldn't understand that those are private companies and the US government doesn't control them. You know. um, so she refused to renew the, the, uh, the agreement on NAMRU. We had offered to uh, change it from a Navy run to a US Public Health Service run organization. The US Public Health Service is one of the uniform services of the United States. Their uniforms look like Navy uniforms, but they are not part of the Defense Department. They are not an armed service. Um, and we offered to replace a Navy captain with a PHS captain and have CDC run the program, not the Navy, but they, they still refused. So it's too bad we lost the program and it was just consolidated with, uh, with Bangkok's. And then finally, trade is a huge, always a huge foreign policy uh, uh, issue for the United States, and it certainly was in Indonesia. We're not a big trading partner with Indonesia. It's a 25-hour flight away. It's hard to get Americans to go there. The travel warning didn't help. Um, 
people talk about Indonesia, and if, I, if I asked you where Indonesia was, you might not know. But if I asked you where Bali was, oh, I've heard of Bali. Well, Bali is an island in Indonesia. It's, it's, it's not the country. So you know, our big trade competitors there are, of course, Japan and China. Uh, even the Germans do better than us. So but some of the things that we were involved in was the, the Indonesian version of Air Force One. Uh, they used to, the president would fly on a Garuda flight just when he wanted to go somewhere. You know, airlines have schedules and they have set numbers of flights to fly set numbers of places. Well, he would just call up Garuda, since it's a state-owned airline, and say, I want one of your 747s. I'm going to Moscow next week. And so that was kind of disruptive to Garuda. And uh, we convinced them that they should have an Air Force One. And we, we beat out. Um, uh, the Europeans for that. And uh, of course, we will outfit that Air Force One with the latest in gear and to make it a user friendly environment for the president of Indonesia. Um, so, uh, so that was a big coup for us to, to, to get that deal. I mentioned before a $700 million deal for a GE uh, 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 rolling stock engines and, and uh, and cars to refurbish their, their train system. And uh, finally, uh, President Obama actually announced the largest single sale of Boeing aircraft in the world last year to Lion Air, which is Indonesia's second largest airline. Garuda actually is the state-owned one. It's not bad. It's quite a good one. And they have successfully bid on some small DOD um, uh, maintenance uh, projects. So they're that good. Lion Air, you would not want to go up in a Lion Air plane. They, uh, they lost, they almost lost one of their new 737s when they were, just before I left, when they were up flying and the red light went on and for an engine, and they only have two, the plane got down all right. Um, but uh, we, the Boeing found out later that, you know, when you fly airplanes, and I'm no pilot, so many hours elapse and you pull the equipment, whether the red light goes on or not. If it's 5,000 hours on this, on this widget, you pull the widget and replace it. That's how it's done. Well, they would fly it until the red light went on. And it's not like driving on the side of the road where you can pull over. So um, don't fly on Lion Air if you, if you go to Indonesia. But they're a great customer of Boeing, I guess. The, and Boeing, actually, it was funny. Boeing was really wasn't too concerned. And I guess their attitude was kind of, well, if they crash one, they have to buy another. And that's not, that's not what, you know, we're trying to convince them, no, there's some, there's some image, some soft power of the US, some image here involved. We don't want US planes going down. And besides, there might be Americans on them. Um, well, that's kind, of a, that's kind of an overview of stuff. And I hope uh, we've got a few minutes left. And I really hope I get some questions. That makes the morning. We didn't, oh, yes. Did you uh, find it difficult to stay offshore so long? Uh, no, um, I didn't. Because in my particular work, most of that, the, the whole consular and visa stuff is done overseas. A lot of the guys who do political or economic work, they spend a lot of time in Washington. Because they, they, you can do that. You know, you, the economic guys work on textile negotiations with the Bangladeshis, and those decisions are made in Washington. But, but in my stuff, it was made overseas. So, and the pay when I went in the foreign service, the pay was horrible. So I, I was looking back over my records. Only like in '83, it was like twenty-four thousand dollars a year. That was, I mean, amazing. If you don't have a job, that, that's a lot. But if you have a wife and a kid on the way, that's not much. So it was expensive to be in Washington then. Very expensive. And now it's just the opposite. Now they, they can't get people to go overseas, two income couples. You know, one, one, one's a foreign service officer, the other's a lawyer or an accountant or something else. And you don't want to pick up and move. But that gets into another point about, the, about job strategies if you want to get into working in foreign affairs. You know, people who join the foreign service or, or the CIA, you want to be overseas. I mean, that's what you want to do. And that's what your career, in fact, the Foreign Service Act, as I said before, says that you have to do that. You cannot spend more than six years in the United States. You have to be overseas or you have to leave the Foreign Service. Um, but it's, you know, those are pretty small windows. When I took, the, I took the exam twice to get in the Foreign Service, I obviously passed it once, but I didn't pass it once. And when I, when I did in the 80s, 20,000 people took the exam and 200 got jobs. So it's a small, again, it's 7,800 officers. It's a small organization. Um, but there are a lot of other people overseas. And typically, those, those agencies have trouble finding, finding folks to send overseas. For example, take Homeland Security. A lot of you guys are doing uh, criminal justice stuff. You, know, you might be a GS-12 or a GS-13. Um, 
uh, ICE investigator with Homeland Security, a TSA guy somewhere, you're a manager, you know, you're, you're managing TSA, you're the you're deputy port director here at Indianapolis Airport. Um, and somebody comes to you and your personnel comes to you and say, look, we've got a GS-13 job in Singapore to monitor, you know, folks going to the U.S. Would you like to take it? Well, for most people in TSA, that's a non-starter. Why is that? Well, it's just their lifestyle. You know, you're living here in Indianapolis. You've got a nice home. You've got a mortgage. You just put a pool in the backyard last year. You know, your, your spouse maybe is a couple hours away from her family. Your kids are in school. You like it. You know, you're, all these, you know, you're in local Kiwanis. All these things are great. You're not going to want to pick up and move. So it's very hard to find, for those agencies to find people at the skill levels that they need overseas. So if you do want an overseas career, if you are interested in doing that, you will find lots of opportunities there. And if, as long as you keep, your, you know, keep yourself an op have an open mind, keep open to it. Yes, ma'am. What have been your experiences in learning foreign languages, <clears throat> and how were you able to do that quickly? Sure. Well, I came into the Foreign Service uh, with French. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts, and because of a lot of French-Canadian immigration there, we started learning French in grade one. And um, my first assignment was in the Philippines. At that time, for budget reasons, we did not get Tagalog training. Normally, well, all Foreign Service officers under this act to get tenure in the Foreign Service must be qualified in a language and must do at least one year in visa work. Now, I, regardless of their future specialty, now I stayed in that particular specialty, so it was good for me. I got to see lots of hundreds of officers over the years. So I went to the Philippines, no Tagalog, no language. I had to check that box, and uh, before. Before, I didn't know where I was going after the Philippines, and this was in the early 80s, pre-internet, you know, pre-Skype, all that stuff, and I didn't have my orders. At some point, a personnel guy in Washington said, oh, yeah, you had some French. We'll send you to a brush-up course in French and send you to Brussels and Montreal. And I thought, well, that's good. You know, my wife's expecting, and that's civilized, and it's close to home. That's great. Well, a month before, I was supposed to transfer. Still no orders. So I stayed up late one night and had you know, operators put through a whole bunch of calls that got to this guy in Washington who couldn't understand who the hell I was calling from you know, Manila. And, and he said, oh yeah, Tunis, that's right. Well, sorry, you know, Brussels is gone and Montreal's gone. You can go to West Africa or you can go to Haiti. And I figured, well, okay, I'll take Haiti because it's in the same time zone as the East Coast in the US. But before I went, I got a four month uh, brush up course in French at the Foreign Service Institute in Washington. Later, um, after Haiti, um, they asked me again, well, you did so well here. Now do you really want to go to West Africa? And I said, no, thanks. I want to go back to Asia. So um, there was a, we have a small consulate in Okinawa for four staff. Uh, and we have about, we had, I think, 20,000 Marines there. We, I think we still have about 20,000 Marines. Every service was in Okinawa, even the Coast Guard when I was there. Um, but they couldn't get guys to go to Okinawa. They said, people, the, 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 the guys who the Chrysanthemum Club, the guys who love Japan, they want to go to Tokyo or Osaka. It'd be like telling somebody who thought he was going to go to New York City, you're going to be assigned to Puerto Rico, you know, a Japanese diplomat. They wouldn't like it. No, all apologies to anyone from Puerto Rico. But I, it was great for me. So I did a one-year language course in, at the Foreign Service Institute in Japanese. Had never studied it before. Um, it went from ground zero up to a Prof, uh, limited professional level, and if, if, you, the, if you do that, you know, if you're in a classroom with two other people and an instructor for six hours a day, five days a week, it eventually sinks in. And then I did the second year of Japanese in Japan. So the state, the government has its language programs. Now, DOD runs its own language programs, but they're very different. They're, they're more for, it's essentially more for folks who are listening to foreign communications. It's not, ours is speaking, it's not, it's not writing, it's speaking and reading. And the defense attaches who serve at U.S. embassies come through our program because they're they're going to be more speaking and, and, and uh, reading. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What is, what is the first step to? The Foreign Service is uh, take an exam. You must be a U.S. citizen between the ages of 20 and 60. No other requirements. Where do you go? Uh, go online. Uh, I think it's careers.state.gov. But uh, there's, no, there's no major required in college, not even a college degree is required. Uh, yeah, one of my best friends in Manila had been a Peace Corps, but was a Missouri farm boy who, in his mid-20s, got sick of the farm, uh, joined the Peace Corps, went to Malaysia, um, stayed on after two years there uh, doing refugee work, passed the Foreign Service exam, came in the Foreign Service. Well, we were on the visa line together in Manila, and we're interviewing 600 people a day for visas to the United States. And you're trying to establish the, the credibility of this person, and they, one or 
one minute interview, two minute interview, and a lot of these folks are farmers. So he could ask them like, oh, you have a pig farm, well, you know, what do you, what do you feed the pigs with and all that. But he went on to become a management officer. So a management officer runs the motor pool, personnel, finance, maintenance, communications, health unit, the nuts and bolts, the real estate manager. And he had a very successful career in the Foreign Service. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting the kinds of people that you do meet. When I went to Saudi Arabia, uh, to the eastern province um, in Dahran, uh, my predecessor was a woman whose husband was a C retired CIA officer. She had followed him around the world. When he took early retirement, she said, well, I like this life. I want to continue doing it. She took the exam, passed the exam at like, I don't know, 45 or something. And her kids were, were pretty much high school by then. So she joined the Foreign Service. And my job there was consul, and she was a consul too, a female consul in Saudi Arabia. Can you imagine that? Actually, she was exceedingly successful. And, 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 and that's, that's another point. You, you find sometimes that you don't think that it would work in a certain situation, who you are or what you are. But it's part of what makes us an exceptional country, that we, that we are, no matter what your race or your religion or your skin color, we, we represent a way of life. We represent a system of laws which is unique in the world. And people know that and recognize it. And as she explained to me under Saudi law, uh, no Saudi male can refuse his grandmother. And she was, by that time, she was the, a grandmotherly age. And I remember the first day I was in the office, and we rarely have an overlap because we have so few people. We usually have a gap between staff, but she, we had an overlap. So she said, I'm taking you to the emirate. Saudi Arabia has three emirates, the eastern, central, and western. Each one is run by either the first or second king or the reigning son. So at that time, it was King Fahd was the king, and Mohammed bin Fahd, the son of Muhammad, the son of King Fahd, was the emir in the eastern province. He was probably 30 years old. He had, a, you know, he had a nice big house in Laguna Beach in California. He liked to spend about six months of the year there. Please don't bother me very much. As long as the oil keeps pumping, everything's fine, everything's cool. Well, unfortunately, in Saudi Arabia, there, we have a, a problem of involving uh, um, children, American citizen children of divorced Saudi American parents, typically a Saudi male, American woman. He's studying here. They get married. They go back. It doesn't work for most American women living in a very traditional Saudi household. She leaves, but the kids don't. And so it's a communications problem. And, and typically, the kids can't communicate with mom. And that was a huge issue. So she had one of these issues. So she said, I need, I need to talk to the emir. So I said, well, do we have an appointment? Thinking, you know, are you going to go into the governor's office here and, or the mayor's office without an appointment and just storm in, just walk in and say, hi, I'm here to talk about this issue about you really don't know anything about, but it's an important issue for me. She said, no, I don't need one. And that's when she told me, no Saudi will refuse his grandmother. So uh, we got in the car, went to the palace, and, and passed. Just, she just started walking past all these guards who knew her. She was this little Irish woman about this tall from Portland, Maine, with a really down east Maine accent. And it was kind of funny to hear her say, assalamu alaikum, in, in her Maine accent. We got, we got as far as the emir's chief of staff, who, of course, knew her and everything else. And, and we got in to see the emir about 10 minutes later. So yeah, it, you'd be surprised at what, uh, at what you can, at what you might, at what you might find. Sorry for the digression. Any other questions? No one's asked me about jails? Everyone has asked me about jails. See, one of the things, you, as I said, a consular officer does visas. We also do uh, services to Americans. And so we, we get to go see jails all over the world. The worst were are in Haiti. They're hell holes. Haitian jails are hell holes. You do not want to be, you do, you do not want to get arrested anywhere overseas because I'm not going to come and get you out of jail. I'm not going to give you a lawyer. Um, I, if you don't give me permission, I can't even tell mom where you are and what's happened to you. So please, you know, when, before you travel overseas, go to travel.state.gov, fill out this form that, that said, puts your personal data in there, get, offers you a chance to check a Privacy Act waiver. So if something happens to you, you've given us permission to talk about you with anybody who you choose or who you do not wish to, to talk about. Um, it'll also start feeding you uh, by email notifications for that part of the world where you're going. But the, the jails are, I have a great Saudi j uh, jail story. So the, so the Saudi prison system, the correction service, is run by very devout Muslims. These are guys who truly believe that they're not there to convert people, but they but convert prisoners. But they believe that they are doing God's work by, by um, 
by um, taking care of prisoners and showing them a, a correct way to live. And uh, in, the, in the Saudi jail system, there's a real ranking. If you're an American prisoner, you're going to get an air-conditioned cell with probably a couple other Westerners. If you're Bangladeshi, you're in a, you're an open bay, unair-conditioned. Uh, the, the, the toilet is one hole over in the corner, and the, and the water is, is a spigot over in the other corner with about 50, 60, 70 other guys. So if you're an American, you're, that's, that's the benefit of our soft power. That's why people ask, well, why is it important that the U.S. be number one in the world? Trust me, if you're arrested, you want to be an American citizen, maybe a Canadian, maybe a Brit, maybe a German or a Japanese or an Aussie, uh, Australian, but definitely American. So we had this American guy there who, um, uh, who decided in Saudi Arabia, of all places, that he wanted to open a bar in his housing compound. Now, the Saudis drink. You can get for 100, and I don't know what it is now, but for 100 bucks you can get a bottle of anything you want in Saudi Arabia. And there are Saudis who drink, and there are Saudis who don't drink. And a lot of the expats will um, make their own liquor because they don't want to spend 100 bucks a bottle. And so you go into the big supermarkets there, and there'll be 50-pound bags of sugar, 20-pound bags of rice. There'll be yeast in big five-pound bags. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, are these people baking scones all day long or what? <laughs> Well, this guy was, it was, was one of these crusty old types, was an aircraft maintainer, had been there for 15 years and just got dumb and lazy and stupid. And so he, not only was he brewing his own, but he, was, he, started, he opened a bar in his compound and he was selling it. And to make it worse, he had Saudi customers come in. Well, of course, the police found out about it after they had warned him, because nobody likes to arrest an American because it's a royal pain in the ass, because then the American consul shows up and we're asking questions and we report to Washington. And then his relatives get onto the Saudi embassy in Washington. And you know nobody likes trouble like that. So, but anyway, he was arrested. So I would go visit him in jail. And the, you know, the warden was very nice. And we had meetings in the warden's office with nice mint tea. And it was air conditioned and cookies and dates. And the warden apologized. And he said, you know, under, he's been convicted. He's been found guilty. And under Saudi law, he must be administered 80 lashes. And then he will be released. Now. You know, if you've all seen like movies Master and Commander or sailing ship movies, you know that the lashing, you could, you know, wind up with somebody in a cat of nine tails and really wail the tar out of them. Well, in, in Saudi Arabia, the imam, the, the, the priest, administers the lashes. And he, hold, he holds the Koran while he's doing it. And so we came to an understanding that instead of holding the Koran in one hand and administering the lashes with the other, that why couldn't he just put the, tuck the Koran under his right arm and administer lashes like this? <laughs> so the guy got his 80 lashes and was deported, didn't have a scar on him. Saudi law was satisfied. They, they have a constituency. All countries have, all governments have constituencies. There's a constituency in Saudi Arabia who thinks that people should not drink. It is bad. It is evil. This is our law, and why do you foreigners come here and get paid big bucks, and you break our law, and you know it, and you've been here 20 years. Yes, you deserve your 80 lashes. Okay, well, they didn't film it. He got his 80 lashes. The warden could sign off. I got him his 80 lashes. The people who, you know, the... We, we do foreign policy by CNN these days, and so the people back in Washington, you know, who, who, who are all worried about, oh, what's going to happen if an American gets lashed for breaking the law? They, they were satisfied because this guy wasn't hurt. Everybody went home, I guess, reasonably intact. He's now a graduate student at Notre Dame? Yes. <laughs> well, I was going to say Purdue since I went to IU, but I, we have some Purdue people well, here. So I, the trick in it. Yeah, yeah, right. So anyway, well, well, if well, no thank more questions, much, yeah, thank you very much. We have a copy of a little book here for you. Oh. in Virginia right now. Feel surprised when he's new biography of Thomas oh, Jefferson. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks very much. Appreciate there's it. There's a note in there. Well, thank thanks you. Thanks for your service. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a little break for lunch. See you back here at 1 o'clock.